you know that before the revolution of France, nobility was a double-edged sword that often came with enormous privilege? But the nobles are able to earn a living through trade, and as a result of this, many people were wealthy in name, but poor in cash. Just like the beginning of the life of Jeanne de Valois Saint Remy, before she changed course in her life by becoming a con woman and started the French Revolution. And I know I just reeled you in with that hook, so I bet you're wondering how. Well, this is why in today's video, I'm going to be giving you the gist of how Jeanne de Valois Saint Remy, in an attempt to change the course of her life, became a con artist and then, you know, started the revolution or whatever. <laughs> Oh yeah, and uh, before we proceed, if you are yet to subscribe to the channel, it would be the best time to do so. Ah, thanks for doing that. Let's move on. Let's take a brief look into Jean de Valois Saint Remy's life. Who is she? How did all this happen? She was a poorish French peasant born in 1756 and descended from the Valois line through the illegitimate son of King Henry II's great-grandfather. Her father, Jacques, was basically a useless person and a drunkard who left her and also her brothers to fend for themselves as they grew up. Jacques inherited an estate from his father near bar sur abine in northeastern France, although he did not inherit enough money to maintain it, especially given his constant drunkenness and his wife's spendthrift nature. When Jean was a child, Jacques relocated the family to Paris, where he hoped to find work as a nobleman. Unfortunately, he was forced to physically beg on the street due to his feudal optimism. Jean was just six years old when her dad died in 1762, while her mother quickly found a new lover and left her three surviving children in the care of the Marquise de boulain villers a benevolent local. Which actually turned out to be a lucky break for the kids, as the Marquise's wife took a shine to these new foster kiddos. Madame de Boulainvilliers was entitled to a small annual income from the crown after proving their royal lineage, enough for Jean's brother Jacques to attend a military academy, and Jean with her sister Marianne attending a boarding school. Later, they were sent to a convent after finishing their education, but Jean did not have the monastic temperament. So, she ran away with her younger sister to her old home in bar sur and that's where their new life began. Whether Jean made a good choice or not is gonna be discovered soon. Jean being an eager person and having lived this way, her primary objective in life was to get out of there as quickly as possible. Which meant marriage for her though. And that was where she met Nicolas de la Motte, a man who proclaimed himself as a Comte de la Motte, making her the Comtesse. Despite the fact that the name was entirely made up, he was the nephew of the family with whom she was staying. One month after their wedding, she gave birth to twins, but they barely lived for a few days. Unfortunately, Nicholas was just as useless as her father, leaving Jeanne to fend for herself. Jeanne was a thin brunette wearing a winning grin and clear blue eyes who loved a luxurious lifestyle. She had an affair with the commanding officer, Marquis d'Altechamps, which resulted in Nicholas resigning from the Gendarmerie. Of course, Nicholas is no saint. He also had affairs with various kinds of ladies. Even though she got married, life was not nearly as luxurious as she had expected but she often received a small pension from the king and queen because of her family name. She decided to ask Marie Antoinette for a larger allowance, hoping that because she was a woman, they, she would be more sympathetic. So how did she go about doing that, you might be asking? Well, it actually wasn't that difficult. At the time, anyone dressed in a suitably opulent manner was permitted to enter Versailles. Unfortunately, Marie had heard about Jean's bad reputation and had refused to actually meet with her. Luckily for her, she got hooked up with the legendary gigolo Rateau de Villette and the aforementioned Marie Antoinette obsessed Cardinal de Rohan. Louis de Rohan sprung from one of France's most noble of families, but at that time he was currently at odds with the royal family, having been one of the most prominent opponents of the Austrian Union, which had been sealed by the marriage of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. Nonetheless, he was wealthy, influential, and completely careless with his priestly chastity vows. In other words, he was the type of patron Jean was looking for. She immediately set about becoming his mistress, and boy was she successful. However, this did not satisfy Jean, so she did what any sensible person would do, and determined to commit fraud. Are you wondering how she pulled the fraud out and became a con artist? Well, she actually did so by observing Rohan. She discovered that no one could spend more than 10 minutes with him without knowing how desperate he was to gain Marie Antoinette's approval. She persuaded the Cardinal that her friendship with Marie Antoinette was far deeper than it was, and that their lack of public connection was due to Jeanne's position as Her Majesty's fixer. Then she provided him with letters, forged by Rito, in which the Queen asked the Cardinal for loans to supplement the King's allowance. 
She got roughly 120,000 francs out of him, which was a large number at the time. But yet, that wasn't enough money or power for Jeanne. And then, she found out about the necklace, which is one of its kind. Now, this was an ugly necklace made by Bomer and Bassange. King Louis XV commissioned them to design a diamond necklace for his mistress, Madame du Barry. Unfortunately, Louis XV died before this necklace was finished. While the new king had no intention of honoring his father's agreement, there was no way for Balmor and Bassange to enforce the original agreement. So they attempted to sell the jewelry, but realized that only the royal family could actually purchase it and they were already going bankrupt. They tried repeatedly to persuade Marie Antoinette to buy it, but she refused it because it said it was insanely expensive and ugly. She stated unequivocally that she had no intention of acquiring anything intended for the royal mistress. Wow, yeah, a jewelry maker was desperate enough to approach anyone who might be able to get the queen's attention, including the Contessa de la Mont. Jeanne decided to capitalize on their despair as an answer to her prayers not knowing it would result in her downfall and unintentionally start the French Revolution. So, what did this masterful con artist do first? Her first move was to spread a rumor, which was only meant for the Cardinal and Beaumaris' ears, and that Marie Antoinette had passionately desired the necklace, but was terrified of her husband's disapproval of the expense if she purchased it. But this rumor had more impact than Jeanne had anticipated. Then she had Rodeau falsify a letter from the Queen Anne to the Cardinal regarding the jewelry. The tone of these letters had turned fairly hot by this point, and the Cardinal was persuaded that the Queen was madly in love with him. Like, for real. And on this ground, he asked for Jeanne to set up a covert meeting. And she saw this as exactly what she needed to do to thoroughly bait the trap. Luckily, Jeanne's husband, Nicholas, who was acquainted with a prostitute named marie Nicole Leguay de Olivia, who bore a striking likeness to Marie Antoinette. So, a late night covert rendezvous in the garden of the Palace of Versailles was organized, where the Cardinal was to meet the Queen, quote unquote. After the meeting, the price of 1,600,000 livres, about 11 million euros in modern currency, was agreed upon, and the cardinal called the jewelers, promising to pay for the necklace in installments. The jewelers were instructed to hand the necklace to Jeanne, who then passed it on to her husband, who began selling individual diamonds in London immediately. Jeanne thought she could easily go away without this, but unfortunately, when the Cardinal failed to pay his first installment and was unable to produce the jewelry, the swindle was eventually exposed. I'm sure the jewelers looked at each other like, Oh shit! We just got duped! The jewelers complained to the Queen, who admitted to being completely unaware of the situation. This plot of Jeanne had made the King and Queen appear really bad in the eyes of the public. By now, you should probably know that Marie Antoinette had nothing to do with all this. She didn't want the jewelry, neither had she been friends with Jeanne. And still, she despised Rohan. But as the whole thing played out, the pre-revolutionary French population despised her and said things like, Bitch, we know you wanted that dreadful jewelry. And the only way to prove her innocence was to arrange a highly public trial for Jeanne and her companions. Unexpectedly, but probably expected due to the nature of this video, there was a little plot twist. The very act of having a public trial backfired because Jeanne put on such a heroic performance which gained her universal sympathy as the victim instead of the instigator. While the Queen, who was already unpopular since she was an Austrian and the French had long harbored prejudices against them, was completely demonized. The blow to the monarchy's reputation was a significant factor in what led to the French Revolution. So, what happened to Jeanne? Well, she was found guilty in order to be whipped, branded, and imprisoned for life as a thief with the letter V for Volius, which, all the while, in the eyes of everybody in France, Marie Antoinette was the actual offender. Does this look like the end of Jeanne? Well, it looks like it, but given the type of person she is, this cannot be her end. She escaped from prison by impersonating a youngster and arrived in London, where she published memoirs of the Comtesse d'Avalois de la Mont. Of course, she did her best to portray herself as the heroine while casting Marie Antoinette as a major antagonist. Despite the fact that the book was banned in France, nevertheless people read it. It was also translated to English, where it was popular for validating the majority of English people's preconceptions against the French. One might assume that after this, she ought to have lived happily ever after in London as a famous novelist and a notorious figure, but that wasn't the case. She died at the age of 35 after falling out of her hotel room window. Would you, what do you think? Did she take a leap? Was she coerced? Was she pushed? How did, that, how, how did that even happen? That just doesn't seem, after all that, after all of that nonsense and, and debauchery and like, you made it out on top after all of that and you're just gonna jump? Maybe she really slipped. Nobody knows. 
But I think it might have been an accident because prior to that, a servant of Marie Antoinette in exile asked her, in exchange for money of a reward, to confess to forging the Queen's signature on the document, authorizing the purchase of the necklace. At the time, Marie Antoinette was a revolutionary prisoner, and the servant thought that this would assist her in gaining pardon. Jeanne retaliated by showing him the burn mark on her chest and branding from the scars on her legs and whipping before sending him out. Her death occurred two years before Marie Antoinette's execution during the French Revolution, whereas there could have been a shift of events if it hadn't been the way for Jeanne and the necklace affair permanently destroying Marie Antoinette's reputation. That is, that's all we got for this action-packed video. I thank you guys for watching.